Federal Department of Transportation created the first funding program for roads. And in that same year, the first road that was worked on in the United States was in Contra Costa County. It was a road that brought people from the suburban areas over to Richmond, where there was a port and a lot of activity going on. Well, Contra Costa has come a long way since 1916, and I am very pleased today to introduce a real rock star amongst transportation executives around the Bay Area. Randy Iwasaki is the executive director of the Tr Contra Costa Transportation Authority, which is our counterpart over in Contra Costa County. He's been uh, the executive director there since 2010. Um, prior to his appointment there, he was the director of the Department of Transportation statewide for a period. He serves on a number of national transportation panels, uh, past chairman of ITS America, appointed to the National Freight Advisory Committee and served chair there. Um, he's a terrific partner for us here in Marin. Uh, he's come over today to talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of his uh, activity over in Contra Costa, and I think you're going to be very impressed. Uh, Randy is the exact fulcrum between thinking big, big, getting stuff done, and having a great time. Uh, so I want to welcome Randy up here, and uh, thank you, Randy. All right, thank you very much. Sorry I have to speak at lunchtime, and I'll try to keep this as short as possible. I have 77 slides, and yeah. you guys want to know about our innovation program, right? All right, let's see if I, this is a, this is a weird, okay. All right, so you know who we are. We're the, we're the, just like you, we're a sales tax authority in Contra Costa County. We're also the congestion management agency. So we measure congestion at about 140 different intersections throughout Contra Costa, produce a biannual report, our congestion management plan. And the reason why we do that is we want to make sure that our investments are paying dividends to help reduce congestion throughout our county. So like you, we've had a couple of sales tax measures, promises made, promises kept. You can't fool the voters if you don't deliver on the first. So you got to deliver on your first measure. That was Measure C. Measure J passed with an overwhelming 71% support in 2004. We, tried, we put another measure on the ballot in November, November 8th, 2016 and got 63.5%, so we're a little bit short there, but we're not, we're not done. Within that measure, we had unattached about 65 million unescalated over 30 years for transportation projects to leverage future transportation. The problem today, in my opinion, is that we don't know what kind of technology or what kind of projects we're gonna to need to invest in in the future. And so in order to pass a sales tax measure, it's a lot easier if you have specific projects and programs. But our board, um, we're governed by an 11-member board. By the way, in order to innovate, you have to have great teamwork. You have to have a great team at your authority. You also have to have a great teamwork at the board level. Because in, at, at least at the authority where I work, my, my team knows that I accept all calculated risks. So if things don't happen right, and I'm, as you saw, I'm getting old. As you can see, I'm getting old. I can retire at any time. And so that kind of helps our staff push forward on some of these uh, crazy ideas that aren't so crazy now. We do a lot of the same things that you do here in, in Marin County. We provide you with a lot of our people that come over into Marin County in the morning to work, and then at night they all jam their way back to uh, Contra Costa County, causing a problem on the Richmond San Rafael Bridge, I understand. There's a little problem there. I don't have to worry about that anymore because I don't work for the state, but I used to get a lot of calls on that many years ago, and I don't have that problem anymore. It's always good to go back in time and remember how far we've come. And so if you've heard this speech before, I apologize, it's very similar, but I'm gonna go through it anyway because some of you haven't heard this speech. The Automation Sputnik program started the space race. John F. Kennedy said, we're gonna put a man on the moon by the end of that decade. You remember that? Some of you remember that specifically? Imagine today, if John F. Kennedy said, let's put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, 
We have to do an EIR, an EIS. We're going to have to do a FSR. We're going to have to do a, get an E76 from Caltrans in order to move our project forward. I'm not sure we could put a man on the moon in today's regulatory climate. So regu regulations have a lot to do with how quickly and how effectively we can innovate in our space. 1939, uh, Flushing Meadows, New York, the World's Fair, they talked about automation, self-driving cars. Walt Disney, a little theme park, he has a theme park, or he's not around anymore, but his theme park to the south of us in Anaheim said, we're going to have driverless cars one of these days. There's been a great partnership between the University of California at Berkeley, Caltrans, General Motors. You heard uh, Lyft was per uh, got a lot of money invested into Lyft from General Motors. The automated highway system program resulted in the early, the late 80s and early 90s in a, a demonstration in 1997 in San Diego on Interstate 15, hands off wheel, feet off pedal. These vehicles were guided by binary coded magnets embedded in the pavement. The binary coding would tell the vehicle how fast to go. It would guide that vehicle into parking situations, but you can't put magnets everywhere. And so that proved that you could, with technology, you could actually have hands off wheel, feet off pedal. Today, autopilot is around. Tesla, how many of you have a Tesla, anybody? I work for the public sector, so I don't have one. <laughs> Does any, anybody here have one? No, okay, well, if you did, you could actually put that vehicle into autopilot. And when you put that vehicle in autopilot, the interesting thing about that vehicle is it's exactly centered in the lane. Now, I followed all of you, most of you, when you came here this morning, and you're not all exactly centered in that lane. How many of you signal when you turn? I, I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it. Another important aspect of transportation and the economy is that the cities were formed around ports. And so Eric Garcetti, mayor of Los Angeles, Kevin Johnson was the mayor of Sacramento, coined the term City 3.0 at the Contra Costa Transportation Authority. We worked our way back. So in the start of time, cities formed around ports. Why was that important? Why did they form around ports? Goods in, goods out, people in, people out, mobility. So these, these cities, New York City, San Francisco, flourished because you had mobility. You could get your goods in, goods out, and the resulting economic growth was fantastic. Well, Dwight David Eisenhower said, we're going to build this interstate tool in 1956, funded the Highway Trust Fund, and built this inter interstate system that wove across the United States, hooked up with those ports, and then the Transcontinental Railroad met in Promontory Point, Utah. So now you could get raw materials into the Midwest to build infrastructure, and you could get those goods, wheat and others, out. And so the economy grew, grew leaps and bounds. Why? Because we had great mobility. We had great contractors building the interstate. I see Mike Gelati here, so I th thought I'd throw in a little uh, contractor plug there. So here's City 3.0, and so the idea is a connected city using technology to reduce the cost of services that we need to provide our citizens. And so my question to you is, who is the largest taxi cab company in the world today? It's not Lyft. <laughs> it's Uber. How many taxi cabs does Uber own? None. Largest seller music? iTunes, right? iTunes. How many record stores? None. There's no record store. So you can actually buy a song on your cell phone while you're watching TV, and you can play that one song over and over and over again. It's great. In my day, I went down to Tower Records. They're, I don't think they're around anymore. I bought that one album. You know, I was listening to this one album, and there's two songs in that whole album that I like, so I had to make a tape of that, threw the album away, and, and listen to those two songs over and over. Today, you can do that. You can just buy the one song. See, I'm reminiscing now. I'm going back in time. We need to remember this because if you have a good transportation system, you have good economy. So today's congestion, everybody complains about, oh my God, Randy, the congestion is bad in Contra Costa County. I said, do you know why? It's because everybody's working. They're going to work at the same time. So what we're trying to do is take a small portion of those people that cause that congestion and move them into, into another mode of transportation. We're trying to incentivize that move. And so in this connected city, we want to place a subscription-based transportation system within that connectivity, whether it's Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 5G, today it's 4G, fourth generation wireless, and we call it City 5.0. We've skipped City 4.0. Do you know why? 
I love Hawaii Five O. It sounds so good. <laughs> City Five O. Just think about that. City Five O. I really like that. Data-driven mobility, sensible digital and digital city, and intermodal innovations. You'll get better data to make better decisions, whether it's investment decisions, whether or not you're you're running your fixed route in the correct location. Can you deviate from that fixed route because you're getting better information? It's actually, we call it City 5.0 because of 5G technology, the fifth generation of wireless. But Hawaii 5.0 is my favorite show and it's very realistic. So if you're not watching it at night, you might want to check on that. <laughs> so this really is a schematic for, for our version of a smart city, City 5.0, 5.0. And this is how we're going to do it. So if you have connectivity, you get better information about how your energy grid's working, how your water system's working, how your buildings are reacting where you're gonna have your next power outage. All this information is gonna help. And then where you need that connectivity for your mobility purposes. Your vehicle is gonna be the third most prevalent connection to the internet, it is now. And we're at, we're at somewhere around 3.564 3 billion connections to the internet. Your vehicle, if you have a new vehicle, it has a little antenna on the top of it. It's connecting either to OnStar, some other BMW, if you have a BMW that's talking through the satellite connection, it's providing you with connectivity. It's also providing Diane and her team here in Marin the potential of getting better information to make better decisions. The other part in our, in our case, and I have another slide deck that we show kind of the proliferation, how fast technology is progressing today. Uber's worth more if you believe the number, than Ford and General Motors in, in less than five years. So technology is taking off. It's getting harder and harder for the public sector to procure the latest technology. So at the authority in Contra Costa, we're trying to figure out ways of making it more performance-based, outcome-based, versus sp specifically procuring version X. And we're, we're working on that. And so once again, if it doesn't work right, I'm expendable and I'll go work in the private sector as a consultant. If anybody, anybody's hiring, by the way, I'm getting older. If it works, we look very smart. So here's kind of setting the stage for some of our technology-based projects. We have a number of projects we call smart mobility in, in Contra Costa County. So we have this VDI, vehicle to infrastructure. So the idea is the vehicles of the future will talk to each other, but they also talk to the infrastructure. So they'll get signal phasing timing information. So your vehicle is traveling toward that one intersection at 60 miles an hour. And that controller is getting ready to go from green phase to yellow phase. That's called SPAT, signal phasing timing information. It's going to relay that out back and forth. It's going to hold that green light in the future so that you don't run that red light and kill somebody. And so the idea is to figure out ways of getting that information. It'll also tell you about weather, potholing information, emission information. So all this information is being developed. So we have a, a test bed, if you will, in, uh, in Walnut Creek, California. And so the traffic engineer has allowed us access into the controller box along the city signals. And that very, very, is anybody here a traffic engineer, by the way, for the city or a county? All of us. No, but you don't. <laughs> What's the first word you were taught as a young lady? As a traffic engineer, what was the first word that you were taught? Don't let a guy intimidate you. No. No, the first word, any good traffic engineer, the first word out of their mouth is no. I would like access to your signal face and timing information. No. Well, we have a traffic engineer, and we're getting more traffic engineers in Contra Costa County that are allowing us into that controller box. And the idea is to make our transportation system more safe. Your transportation system. Chris and I were talking, he's gonna talk about connected trucks. The idea is these vehicles will be able to connect up. There'll be very little brake lag. They'll be using vehicle to vehicle technology. When the front brake hits its brake, the second truck within a nanosecond will hit their brakes automatically. So you, you eliminate that brake lag. You eliminate the lag from, the, from just from the reaction time. So they can follow closer they get better fuel mileage. Now Peloton, who isn't here today, wanted me to say a few words about Peloton, so I've just said two. Peloton twice, that's the third time. Their idea is that if two vehicles can follow very closely together, the front truck saves about 4.5% in fuel, the rear truck saves about 
That can be the difference between a good year and a bad year for trucking. We're about 30,000 truck drivers short, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And, and um, we need to figure out ways of moving more goods as the population grows here in the Bay Area. Connected trucks, you'll hear more about that. We built a uh, transportation hub in Contra Costa County at Pacheco. I didn't know where Pacheco was. It's not really a, it's a city, but it's not really a, an authorized city. I'm not really sure what you call those non-authorized cities, but it's Pacheco City. It's, it's, it's in Contra Costa. It's right there along by Concord. They have a park and ride lot. They, I was asked twice by a board member. The first time they asked, I went out to this desolate area, and I thought there's no way we can build a, a smart transit center here out in the middle of nowhere. So I kind of let it go. Our board chair, Julie Pierce at the time, asked me twice. That's my, my, my uh, performance criteria. If you ask me something I don't want to do once, and you, f you forget about it, okay, I'm not going to do it. That's good. But if you take the time to ask me twice, so she asked me twice, go out to Pacheco and take a look at this. When are you going to build this transit hub? We all went out and we took a look at it. Today, that transit hub has the ability to, has LED lighting, it has light dimming technology, so when nobody's there, you're not burning those lights at 100%, you're saving money. It's got copper wire theft, it's got cameras, it's got a parking app, and it's got sensors in every parking lot, and it's got electric vehicle charging stations. You can make reservation for that EV charging station. We're bullish on the electric motor in Contra Costa County. It's going to help us reduce greenhouse gases. And we all also relay information out through a smartphone app or through the change of message sign, how many spaces are available at that site. And that's important because you don't want your constituents to drive out there and there's no parking spaces in the future. We can use technology to relay information, valuable information, so that the traveling public can make better decisions. And that's what we're trying to do. IDTO, it's an integrated dynamic transit operation. It's in a partnership with UC Berkeley and Tri-Delta Transit, one of the transit providers in Contra Costa County. Dynamic dispatching. Hey, I'm getting old. I can't walk as far. I can't walk as fast, and I can't walk to that transit stop, but I want to take the bus. So I use a smartphone application, and I say, I, I want to be an authorized rider. The dispatch says you're authorized. The bus deviates from this route. It picks me up. And it, and it makes up the route. So the idea is, once again, why are, you, why are you on a fixed route if you're not picking anybody up? Right? That's right, see? So we're trying to do that. Connection protection. So the idea here is when BART is a little bit late, and BART's never late, but when they are late, and you have a bus there, the bus takes off on its schedule, and BART arrives a little bit late, and all you see is the exhaust fumes of the bus leaving, and you're saying, that doesn't do me any good. Why? Because 20 minutes later, there's the next bus. And so we're trying to protect that connection using technology. And the last piece of it is dynamic ride sharing. We had a conversation with Lyft. We're still having in a conversation with Lyft. And we're trying to find a way of providing that first and last mile. And I think we have a solution. And I'll show you that in a couple slides from now. We just procured four fully electric buses that are inductively charged. And so the difference between this is this is a wave, by the way. Wave technology is the inductive charger. It looks like a 55-gallon oil drum that's dropped into the ground. And this is an OEM base. It's not a retrofit of the inductive charging. So it's the first one in the nation that this truck, this electric trolley will center over this inductive charger. And through that big magnet that you see, that's how the forces are charging that battery. And so it'll dwell there for 10 minutes. It'll take off. It'll come back around. And I'll dwell there 10 minutes again. The idea is we're reducing greenhouse gases. It's very quiet. It's not like a noisy bus. Very, very convenient. Come on down to Walnut Creek. Go shopping. Park at the BART station on Ignacio Valley Road, the Walnut Creek BART station. Come into town. Spend a lot of money because we get a half-cent sales tax on that. <laughs> and then leave, and you can try out this electric bus. It's great. The other thing we're looking at as a kind of a, as a benchmark for a smart city is Phillips has a smart pole. So this, this light pole has LED lighting. It's going to reduce your bill by 20% if you're in running the city or the county here. But it also has the guts as a smart pole it's for a cell phone. So the connectivity in your downtown is going to get better. They're looking at in, in developing a signal light pole so that way it can go in both directions, north, south, east, west, however, the four quadrants, because it's hanging out over the intersection. These light poles only go one direction up and down the street, but we're deploying these in Oakley currently. Risk Synergies is a startup company. We, we're getting a lot of startup companies coming to see us. We're deploying this in, in a location in Pittsburgh where pedestrians, they have a higher than average rate of pedestrian hits. 
And so what they do is they use cameras and they watch, watch the activity and they look for near misses. And when they can calculate what's happening, they can, we can, as, traf as traffic engineers, you can develop a system to fix that fatality or those, those near misses. And if you don't know about it, you can't fix it. Robotics, one of the issues that you probably have here that we have also in Contra Costa County is that we don't do a great, great job of, of looking at our assets, our road, roadway assets. So we're going to use, with this company, this is a spinoff of Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh with an H. We're going to deploy it in Pittsburgh without the H, California. And the idea is to use cell phone technology on cars, whether it's owned by the city or the county, and they'll take inventory as they drive around, and you'll be able to get um, a pretty good depiction of the condition of your signs, whether or not your signs are being covered by foliage, your, your roadway condition, your striping. So we're going to start there. So they came to us, and we agreed, and so they're going to actually go into Oakley and Pittsburgh. So we've also developed the largest secure autonomous vehicle test facility in the United States. It's 5,000 acres. I'll show you a slide on that. The reason why it's, it was developed isn't for technology purposes. Uh, Assembly member Bonilla used to be supervisor Bonilla. She called me into, her, into the lunchroom after a board meeting where we had a, a very poor speaker. And so she was getting, saying some terse uh, things to me about the quality of the speakers at the board meeting that night. And then there wasn't enough food. And, and then she said, and by the way, when, when Concord redevelops the Naval Weapons Station, you need to figure out a way of creating smart jobs. And I said, Supervisor, I agree, it's my responsibility for the speakers, it's my responsibility for dinner, but why is it my job to go help Concord? And so anyway, long story short, she ended up, uh, we ended up creating this, this test facility. We're going to make it a permanent facility. The city is working with us now to figure out a way of making a permanent testing facility there in perpetuity, whether it's going to be a tech center in the future or it's going to modify into something else. The idea is to create smart jobs. Not, we don't want all the jobs from the Silicon Valley, just some of them. So that a lot of the people that now commute down to the Silicon Valley or San Francisco can stay in Contra Costa. And that's going to be part and parcel to our congestion relief program. Four major programs there. Jo jobs, I'll, I'll talk about these four areas in more, more specifically. So jobs. So the idea is to create smart jobs. That was, that was the initial endeavor. That's why I got involved about six years ago and looked at this facility. And I thought, my god, what a, what a great opportunity for testing. Efficient mobility. So if cars refuse to crash in the future, about 50% of your congestion is caused by non-recurrent issues, like the Super Bowl, like the World Series, or the A's of the Giants, right? So those create congestion weather events. But a majority of that 50% is caused by accidents. And so if we can eliminate accidents, your system gets more efficient. Your system gets more efficient. Safety, so the sensors that you, we used to laugh, you see the beanies in, on the Google car, they're very large and everybody laughs at those. Well, the sensors in your buttons were part of the AHS program back in the 90s. So those were very large as well, but now if you own a brand new car, there's a little buttons on your bumper. Those are sensors. That's why when somebody taps your bumper, it's $4,000. Why be, you're saying, my, rub, my plastic bumper's not worth $4,000. There's just a little dent there, but all the sensors got misadjusted or the damage, so you have to replace all that. And then, as I mentioned, we're, we're bullish on the electric motor in Contra Costa County. So we have done an analysis. So we're changing the way we do our long-range plan. So we're using technology to go out to all four corners of our, of our county. We're using social media. We're using our, our web page. We're using an inverted inverted telephone town hall system where in the old days it used to send out information. So Supervisor Kinsey used to say, hey, this is Supervisor Kinsey. This is what I want to do for you in, in Marin County. Vote for me. And this message was approved by me. Well, now what we do is we go out and robocall everybody. They call into this town hall and they tell us, they ask us questions for over an hour in each of the four sub quadrants. We didn't have to leave our office. But we got more comments this cycle than previous 25 years combined. And so we're getting better information about what our voters want. And I haven't talked about that, but we are addressing this issue of the digital divide. How do you provide access to people that can't afford a car? How do you provide people that can't afford a cell phone the ability to hail your cab, hail your, your bus? And so working on different, different issues. But in our models, we're modeling a different efficiency. Farron Pierce is helping us. They're our consultant. We're not using the, the normal 2,000 vehicles per lane per hour. We're actually increasing that to 3,300 vehicles per, per lane per hour. 
But in order to reduce greenhouse gases, we've modeled that if we can turn our fleet over in Contra Costa County to a 57% zero emission vehicle fleet, we can reduce our greenhouse gases by 80% by the year 2050. So it's pretty good. We're excited about that. It's, uh, this, is, this is the site. It's 5,000 acres. San Francisco is, is about uh, seven miles by seven miles. This is seven miles by a mile and a half. So it's about the fifth the size of San Francisco. When you're testing autonomous vehicles, do you want a brand new piece of pavement or do you want a pavement that looks like a normal piece of pavement? Well, I would say that this looks more like America than a brand new piece of pavement. And so this is where we're testing. We can always make this look good, but it's very difficult for a contractor to put down a lousy piece of pavement that's worn out. <laughs> it's very difficult to stripe an old piece of striping that's barely there. And so this is a test facility and we're bringing it up. So I have some slides on our partners there. We have tunnels, so when you lose GPS, there's 1,400 foot long tunnels. We have under crossings, some guarded by guardrails, some not, the center uh, bents. With skid testing, smart parking, and imagine the future, you and your spouse goes out for a drink, you hail your car, it comes back and gets you. Your parking is going to change because you don't have to open the doors in the future. So BART just recently delayed building a $37 million, 520 space facility on their system. That's $71,000 of space. So if you're building new, new parking in the future, you might want to think about that investment twice. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's a good idea to delay it. All I'm saying is that at least our crystal ball shows that if doors don't have to open, you get more cars in there. There's a number of things that are going on with parking that can help you in the future. So Honda's testing. Honda's testing not only automated vehicles, their Acura RLX, but they're also testing vehicle to infrastructure. They have, a, they have a motorcycle, an autonomous motorcycle, and so these will be displayed on March 30th at our Redefining Mobility Summit. Auto, once again, they delivered 17,000 452 cases of Budweiser beer down to 25 in Colorado. The key question is, why didn't they do it in California where they're based? Well, the laws here don't, don't allow that. So they got to go to Colorado and deliver Budweiser beer in a state that's normally known for Coors. <laughs> At least I'm not a beer drinker, but that's what I hear. Baidu. Baidu is an internet company based out of China. And so they've been testing on a daily basis almost since September. And this is something you may be interested. So one of the comments back is, I'm getting old. I can't walk to the BART station. I, I can't walk to the transit hub. I'm rich and I get up late and by the time I get to the, the BART parking lot, every, every space is full at Rock Ridge, so I have to drive to San Francisco anyway. How can you help me? And so we scoured the universe, started with the planet Earth and we found this, the easy mile. It's the most, probably the most, most sophisticated shared autonomous vehicle in the world. It's seat six, it's stand six more. It has its electric vehicle power, it's electric motor. It's got a ramp for wheelchair. It'll hold one wheelchair or 12 people. It might even hold a dog. <laughs> and so we're testing it now at Gomentum Station. We got the only piece of legislation in the United States, AB uh, 1592. It exempts us from the steering wheel, brake pedal, and, a, and an operator. And so we got that signed by the governor. That was not easy. We were able to get that done. We have a lot of different partners. Best Mile, they're trying to, they're a software company that helps optimize routes. First Transit, they're, they're probably going to own and operate fleets in the future. So they're making this business investment because they're, they can see the future. Stantec, Habib, Shamsku's here. We've, I've worked with Habib for over 20 years on the AHS program days, and now Stantec provides us with project management help as well as our strategic consultant. Bishop Ranch, parking. Bishop Ranch is redeveloping the inside of Bishop Ranch, a 600 acre business park. The first thing the city officials said is you need to provide more parking. He's saying, why do I have to provide more parking if these autonomous vehicles are coming our way and it's gonna require less parking? So he's invested in this technology. Chadi's here, he lives in, in San Ramon. He lives near the Bishop Ranch. With, they pay for, de for buses, express buses, to come from both BART stations. He can't get on one of those buses. Why? Because he can't park his vehicle in one of those parking lots and the structures in Bishop Ranch. In the future, he could get on one of these shuttles, and instead of deadheading back, it could be full of, the express buses could be full going back to the BART stations. Bay Area Rapid Transit, parking is a big issue. How do you get the customers there? 
And then Bay Area Air Quality Management District has invested a lot of money in this, in this pilot project because it's electric motors. And so we've agreed to roll out over 90, 90 of these vehicles. We have a plan for 150 along Interstate 680. So here's our three-year testing program. And we're, as I said, we're first testing out at Gomentum Station. Then we're going to test out at a business park parking lot. Then we're going to roll it out on the streets, the 600-acre business park. That's why we needed legislation. And this is the ultimate rollout in Contra Costa County. So those bubbles all have a number like two, one, three. And that's how many easy mile shuttles we're going to, or some similar technology for Contra Costa County. So we're going after money. The state is not invested in this yet. The feds are recently named us as one of the 10 test facilities proving grounds in the United States. And so we're excited about that. Hopefully we'll, there'll be some federal dollars attached as long as we don't have to get an E76 through Caltrans, we should be in good shape. Uh, March 30th, 2017 is our third annual Redefining Mobility. I, I, I recommend that, you know, if you can, come on over and check it out. I think if, if Lauren's still here, she probably talked about these, but these are some of the impacted kind of industries that will be affected by the autonomous vehicle connected vehicle program, some in a positive, some in a negative way. But I would tell you that parking lots, if you're building parking structures, you might want to take a look at those. So here's how I think here's what you, we need to do together. We need to gear up for this new age of mobility, and that's what you're doing today. So my, my applaud to you, Diane, for setting this up. I know it's a, it's a pain to your staff, too. It's not easy to set these things up, get all the speakers in, get everybody situated. But this is what we need to do as an industry, is to talk about the new era of mobility. Embrace technology. Some people are afraid of technologies. When I first got to the authority seven years ago, my staff said, if you want to keep your job, boss, don't talk about ramp metering and don't talk about uh, hot lanes. And I said, we got a, we got a real problem here because I really, I, I really embrace technology and I think it's the way to go. So seven years later, our board is very supportive of this technology overlap between that and transportation because they can see a definite value. And I think you have a, you have a great leader here as well. And develop your in-house program. I think you're, we're trying to do that here in the Marin County. And you're going to have to program these things and you have to fund them somehow in your, your fiscal year policies to make sure that you have a funding source just in case if you have something that you want to do in the future and your partner doesn't have dollars. And then we follow the money. We're always, we're going to Washington, D.C. I mean, if you had a grant program here in Marin County, we'd apply in Contra Costa County. <laughs> and then seek consultant help. Consultants are very good at what they do. I mean, they provide a good kind of a view of, the, of what's happening all the way out there because a lot of times, in our case, we're a 20-person organization. Diane, you have uh, 21 people, is that right? 11. Oh, okay, so you're a little small now, sorry. <laughs> I guess you're more of a pea shooter sized organization than we are. And then, and then, and then buckle up and, and get ready for this transformation because it's a golden opportunity to kind of, as I said, check out the overlap between technology and transportation and envision a greater future for you here in Marin County. And I believe that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. obviously taken your team and developed this culture where you guys are seeking every new opportunity and stuff, but that doesn't happen overnight. So what are kind of the steps of building blocks to be able to, I think this is a great first step for transportation agency Marin, but what are some of the other things, best practices that you guys have used to get where you guys are now? So it's, it's a great question, Mike. So we, we, we started with little steps, right? And so in, in our, our authority, the calculated risk part is mine. That's, that's mine. So what I ask our team is, you, you need to make decisions very quickly in, in our business, and a lot of times we don't do that. And so I, I, I live by this four rules for making a decision. We'll improve customer service. We'll make us a better partner. We'll make us more efficient. Is, and is it innovative? If it is, those four things, and, the, and you can say yes to those four things, then go make the decision, move on with the program. 
and I back you 100%. I'll back you 100% if, if they don't meet the four, but at least have an understanding that it's going to make us more less efficient, then I'm gonna, we're going to have to answer that to the board. So we started with small steps. We're, we're out there, and once you, once you're, I think you're viewed on the outside from a technology company as a place that embraces technology and can implement that, then we get calls literally on a daily basis from the, these startup companies that say, we want to take a place an incubator, if you will, that is willing to take risk. How can you help us? And so brisk, brisk synergies and road, road metrics or robotics called us a couple weeks ago. We're deploying that already. And, and so I, I think as your, as your innovation program builds, you're going to build momentum. And then you'll, you'll see a lot of different companies come into Marin County. And really, I shouldn't be here telling you the secret sauce because you guys are going to start doing that, but you know, we're all in competition. And, and what, what I would say is we're, we're in competition, it's cooperation, we cooperate, we're in competition. But if something deploys in Contra Costa, it's gonna work here. Likewise, if something deploys in Marin County, it's gonna work in Contra Costa County. And as you expand the test bed overall to the Bay Area, I think more dollars are gonna come to help us on the other piece, Mike, is that is to fund these. So part of our problem is that the measures are built so rigidly that you have no flexibility in your funding. So you literally have to go out and follow the money to get grants in order to fund these initiatives. And so that's one of the things that we took away on our, on our Measure X that failed in November is that build a pot of money that's unattached where you can leverage. And so I did have a slide and did talk a little bit about leverage technology. Yes? Um, you had a couple of slides that uh, talked about uh, the, the telecommunications. You had the smart light poles and a, a slide that showed some satellites. What is Contra Costa doing to ensure you have the telecommunications capabilities you'll need to implement all these different innovations in the future? So the first step is, I think, if you're going to build a, a city 3.0, that's a connected city, you're going to have to some, have some benchmarks. So we're in, in conversations with uh, tele, tele provider um, Verizon. And so we're looking at that. The other piece is you have drop calls or you, you don't have good connectivity. That's why we have the smartphone kind, or the smart pole grid kind of taking a look at that and making sure that we have connectivity throughout. And then you can put Wi-Fi readers and Bluetooth readers and things like that on your, your light poles. But I think it starts out with making sure you have a good connectivity within your city. And I think our, our first city that's looking at that is Oakley. So Oakley has recently inked a deal. You can look on their, on their agenda. They inked a deal with uh, Philips to provide a network of those smart poles throughout Oakley. And uh, that's kind of the benchmark, the fabric, if you will, the, the, the base to provide that te technology. And then we have to cut a deal with a provider, whether it's AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile. And the other thing you can do is when your, your members of Congress come by, talk about saving the spectrum because that 5.9 gigahertz, the dedicated short range communication that was set aside for transportation back in the 90s, it's worth billions, it's 75 megahertz bandwidth. So it, it's worth billions of dollars in the open market. And they're trying to take half of that and use, vi use it for video games. I think the 75 megahertz is more, as long as it works, it's better suited for making sure that our roadways are the safest they possibly can be and we can reduce that 30,000 or to 40,000 fatalities per year down to zero. That, in my opinion, is the only way to do it. We're not going to get there by straightening a road because a over 90% of the causes of accidents are caused by human error. And so the car manufacturers have been trying to kind of engineer out the driver for years, the seat belts and all that stuff. So I hope that answers your question. Yes? Yes? Is it a hard question? I don't know. OK. Um, one of the things that you talked about which really impressed me was risk taking. And how do we convince more of our leaders to be that way instead of just worrying whether they're going to please their constituents with an individual decision? And I, I just find that too many of our bodies are not forward looking enough and not willing to take risks in order to get somewhere. Do you have any suggestions? Well, I think, I think Having this kind of meeting is a start. Ex exposing, I, we couldn't do any of the things that we do without permission of the board. So right away, I know that, and I tell my team, 
our, the team at CCTA, we're, we're not a staff run organization, we're a board driven organization. And so that helps provide some insulation to us when we come up with these ideas and we have to present it to the board. If it doesn't sell to the 11 member board, it's not going anywhere. But the risk part of it is presenting it to elected officials that are open-minded enough to say, yeah, I like that idea, Randy, or I like that idea, Lindsay, or any member of the CCTA team. And the other thing I think is that the risk taking starts at the top of your organization. And so I think Diane has taken risk by having, hosting this, because number one, nobody may show up, right? So that was one issue. Uh, number two is it, it presents something that, that she's gonna have to do now that she doesn't wanna do. Or number three is, is it presents something that she should have been doing that she hasn't been doing. But she's taking risk, right? And, and, and so, but I think her board is very supportive. Our board at CCTA, our 11 member board, I, I love them. They're, they're great. I, I could work for those guys for another 10 years. I'm not, but I could. And that, I think it starts out with a combination between the board and, the, and, the CC, and your team here at, at TAM making sure you guys are all integrated. We don't have a lot of, we don't have offsites and things like that, but we do talk about technology quite often. And then having Diane, you know, it, people really take a look at their leader. And if their leadership is supportive of risk taking, they mimic that. If the leader doesn't take any risk, government officials are not paid or compensated to take risks. There's absolutely no upside to risk taking because you're not going to get a bonus. You're, you know, a lot of times the board won't say, hey, great job, Frankie, you did good. I think our board has, has started, has, does that. They, they recognize good work, right? And they, they, they uh, reinforce risk taking in a positive fashion. And then. I wasn't necessarily referring to Yeah, this is general, in general, yeah, in general, yeah, absolutely. In general, that's the way it works. Government officials are not paid to take risk, not compensated. I think you made passing references to the many agencies that are involved in getting anything done. How do you work through that by way of example with, you mentioned a lot of promising technologies. There's some old technologies that we don't seem to be able to implement in this county. Ramp metering, for example, has been proven to reduce Absolutely. transit times by 20 to 50 percent. We've got the lights up. Nobody's turning them on, and the reasons we get back is too many agencies or somebody ran out of budget, and it's just sitting there with no implementation. And this is proven ex excellent technology, far less complicated than many that we're talking about here. How do you get things done? So we, we actually, Contra Costa County did not have a ramp meter turned down when I first got there seven years ago. And, and the ramp meters are now on, on State Route 4. Our board did not like ramp metering because it wasn't explained to them, I think, properly. And so we've gone to having the two, two um, we're, we're trying to break down a technical answer to a technical question by using visuals. And so we have two funnels, and we have one where you pour all the rice in one funnel and you meter the rice, and you're actually going like three times through this rice thing. And people go, wow, that works really well, right? So one of the things we try to do is break down the answer to, I'm serious, to common English so that people can visualize that that makes a lot of sense. And then when you deploy, make sure it works. So if you don't, if you de in our case, metering worked great. And so they, they, they really like that now. And the other thing that, and use technology to leverage other technology. And so I'll give you this example, bus on shoulders. You're going to, one of these days, want to, if you haven't already talked about it here in the county, you're going to say, hey, during peak hour, when traffic goes below 35 miles an hour, why can't we use the outside shoulder? Well, the, the CHP's gonna say, we can't do that, that's my office. Caltrans will say, you can't do that, that's my office. But at the end of the day, when those buses go past the non-ramp, you're gonna have to hold that, you're gonna have to hold that traffic in order to provide safety, that's a ramp meter. The other thing they'll tell you is, oh my God, you don't have enough capacity, you gotta widen the ramps. Well, in Minnesota, they have a big sign that says, when meter on, form two lines. People get along just great. So they use a the shoulder during that peak hour in the morning and the peak hour in the evening. And then, so you don't have to stripe and you don't have to you know, widen it out 24 more feet to tune of $8 million. So find innovative ways, find ways of talking to the public in plain English. And I think you'll, you'll be well served. 